Hello and welcome to Health Professional Radio. I'm your host, Neil Howard. Thank you for returning for another segment. We're going to be speaking with returning guest, Dr. Bruce Sands, this morning. He's joining us here to give us some information about the Phase 2 Galaxy 1 trial concerning Trimphia. Welcome back, Dr. Sands. How have you been? Just great. Thanks very much. Good to be back. Well, for those uh, listeners who may not be familiar with you as a contributor, talk about um, what you do and where you do it. Sure. Uh, I'm the chief of the division of gastroenterology at Mount Sinai in New York, a very large health system. And uh, Mount Sinai is very well known for its work in inflammatory bowel disease, uh, dating back to the identification of Crohn's disease by Dr. Burl Crohn at Mount Sinai in the 1930s. Uh, I've been involved in clinical trials in IBD for more than 24 years. This trial that we're going to talk about later on, the Phase 2 Galaxy 1 trial concerning Trimfire, we'll, we'll talk about that in a moment. But first of all, give us a, a bit of insight into the treatment landscape currently concerning Crohn's disease. Yeah, well, we have a growing number of agents that are effective in the treatment of Crohn's disease. Historically, conventional therapies had included 5 aminosalicylates However, those are not effective, not shown to be effective in Crohn's disease, though still widely used in clinical practice. Of course, steroids can be useful for short-term but not long-term treatment because of their many side effects. Uh, and then in the 80s and 90s, we had wide use of immunomodulators such as the thiopurine agents and methotrexate. And then the real innovation was in 1998 with the introduction of anti-TNFs like infliximab, adalimumab, and servolizumab pegol over time. Mm -hmm. Uh, beyond that, and that was the introduction of biologics, which really revolutionized the field and created benefits for patients uh, that were previously not seen, uh, and newer agents that had better safety profiles and also excellent efficacy in the realm of biologics later included uh, the use of vetalizumab and uh, more recently, ustekinumab. And ustekinumab is an anti-IL-12 and anti-IL-23 antibody that Elizmab uh, is an anti inchcrin alpha-4 beta-7 antibody. They all have a role in the treatment of patients with Crohn's disease. Talk a bit about how Crohn's impacts a person's quality of life. Right. Well, the first thing to understand is that the median age of diagnosis is 30 years of age, meaning half the patients are younger and half the patients are older at diagnosis. And because it doesn't dramatically affect the longevity of a patient, that means these patients have really a chronic condition with which they have to deal for their whole lives and uh, really through the prime of their life, childbearing years and so on, uh, productive years. And because the, the main manifestations are abdominal pain, diarrhea, and quite a few other extra intestinal manifestations such as fatigue and a variety of other things, uh, the disease is really quite impactful for the patient. And so... Since we don't have cures and surgery is also not curative, the disease most often reoccurs very rapidly, we have to find ways of long-term managing these, this condition. Now, I did mention that we were going to talk about the Phase 2 Galaxy 1 trial. Give us some insight into this trial. Why exactly was the trial conducted? Well, the Galaxy 1 study was conducted to investigate the efficacy and safety of an agent called gaselcomab uh, for the treatment of Crohn's disease that's moderate to severe in activity. And uh, gaselcomab is an anti-IL-23 antibody. I mentioned before that ustekinumab, which is approved, blocks both IL-12 and 23. This agent blocks just IL-23. And while it may be counterintuitive uh, to consider that blocking one cytokine might be better than blocking two, uh, there does seem to be some benefit in avoiding blockade of IL-12. And uh, so this agent was looked at as a treatment for patients with Crohn's disease, uh, many of whom in this study also had failed other biologic agents, including anti-TNF antibodies, which uh, heretofore were our most powerful agents. So a fairly refractory group of patients. Um, and the, the purpose was really to look at both the short-term and the long-term efficacy and safety in a phase two design. So what were some of the key findings from the study? Yes, well, the first was an exploration of various doses for induction. Uh, patients were assigned to either get uh, gaselcomab as a 1,200 milligram IV dose every four weeks or in another arm, 600 milligrams IV every four weeks 
or in the third arm, 200 milligrams IV every four weeks. There was also a reference arm, that for direct statistical comparison, to Eustachinumab, which I mentioned is already approved, and that was dosed according to the approved label in the United States, which is uh, 6 milligrams per kilogram intravenous load, and then 90 milligrams subcutaneously every eight weeks thereafter. Mm -hmm. And then finally, there was a fifth arm of placebo IV, and the patients were followed out to week 12. And uh, notably, uh, all of the treatments, um, all of the gasalcumab arms, regardless of the dose, were superior to placebo during induction. The primary outcome here was uh, the least squared mean change from baseline in the Crohn's disease activity index score. That's a standard scoring system for Crohn's disease. And all all of the treatment arms for gisulcumab had very substantial reductions in CDAI, whereas placebo had very modest reductions. Um, I should mention that eustachinumab, as you would expect, also was effective, but and there was not a direct comparison to gisulcumab, but gisulcumab uh, seemed to have superior, numerically superior rates of uh, reduction from baseline CDAI score. So that was the primary outcome. And the drug also seemed to work fairly quickly. You saw re uh, significant reductions in the Crohn's disease activity index by as early as week four in comparison to placebo. And very importantly, the drug also worked in the biologic failure and conventional failure patients. What was reported at the European Crohn's and Colitis Organi Organization uh, meeting this year were the maintenance results. So what I just told you had been presented before. Mm -hmm. In the maintenance phase of this study, uh, which extended from week 12 induction out to week 48, um, patients were assigned to get 200 milligrams of gisulcumab subcutaneously now every four weeks um, if they had gotten the 1,200 milligram induction or the 600 milligram induction, um, they were followed out. And if they were assigned to the 200 milligram IV induction, they had a slightly lower dose or half the dose of 100 milligrams sub-Q every eight weeks, and then the eustachinumab patients continued on, and placebo-treated patients, if they responded, they continued on placebo until they were no longer responding. Um, so these results were reported uh, very recently and show very substantial rates of clinical remission all the way through week 48, which was the, the end point of the study. And numerically, again, higher rates in corticosteroid-free clinical remission at week 48 with the gisulcumab treated patients as compared to, uh, in, in the reference arm, the used to kinumab patients. So generally what you get is an impression that this is a very valuable maintenance agent. And the last thing is the safety. So throughout induction and throughout the maintenance phase, uh, really there were no, no significant issues that came out in terms of infection, cancer, um, really any concerning uh, safety issues. So it really seems to be a safe and effective agent. Is there anything that you'd like to add for our listeners? Yeah, I, I mean, just to put these results into perspective, um, certainly the anti-TNF antibodies have been a revolution in the treatment of patients with Crohn's disease, but there is concern about their long-term safety in terms of infection and lymphoma risk and a variety of other adverse events. If the safety profile of gisulcumab holds up over time, which it has seemed to do as the drug is approved in other indications, uh, we expect it to be safe in Crohn's disease as well. It seems to be a really safe and effective induction and maintenance agent. So we'll really look forward to the phase three results for this agent in Crohn's disease. Well, Bruce, I appreciate you uh, returning and sharing some more of your time. Hopefully we'll have an opportunity to speak again uh, during our ongoing coverage of ECHO 2022. Thank you so much. You've been listening to Health Professional Radio. I'm your host, Neil Howard, in conversation with Dr. Bruce Sands. Audio copies of this program are available at hpr.fm and healthprofessionalradio.com.au. You can also subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, listen in, download at SoundCloud, and be sure and subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com, Health Professional Radio.